Okay, if you want to go ahead and take out your slides for chapter 10 and also keep this uh, offer to purchase and contract from the North Carolina Association of Realtors handy, um, we'll go ahead and get started with chapter 10. So, like I said last night, we have two chapters that are all about contracts. Chapter 9, which we covered last night, is generic contract law. That's questions about contracts. Chapter 10 is much more questions about the contract. And when I say the contract, I don't mean to indicate that there's only one contract in the world. Why do I call it the contract? It's the most common one used in North Carolina and it's the only one that we specifically teach you in this class. So everything else we teach you about contracts is sort of information for all contract law. What we teach you about this contract are the very specific things. So I, I want you to shuffle in your mind. You've got to create two different file cabinet drawers in your head. Are we talking about contracts or are we talking about the contract? Because everything we talk about that's in this document tonight, you need to understand, is only in this document. Don't take it, because I'll have people, for example, one of the things we'll talk about in this document is there's a 14-day right to delay closing in here for either party. If they're not ready to close, they get up to 14 days after the scheduled closing day to try to close and not be in breach. Does that make sense for everybody? So inevitably, I'll get a phone call or an email from an agent who's got a buyer that's buying a new construction house. And they'll say, this builder's trying to charge us $200 a day if we don't close on time. They can't do that, can they? They got to give us 14 days. And I'm like, did you use the standard offer to purchase and contract? What do you mean? What contract did you use? Well, we used the builder's contract. Well, do you think the builder's contract could possibly have some language in there that might say you would owe $200 a day if you aren't ready to close? Absolutely. So what I'm cautioning you against is learning the stuff that's in this document and taking it to mean every contract is structured that way. They're not. When we talk about things that are in this contract, these are things that are very specific to this contract. Does that make sense for everybody? So make sure you can separate them. How did I say you'd be able to tell the difference on the test if you're answering a contract question or a question about the contract? How, how did I say you'd be able to tell the difference? If it's in the national section, it's a what kind of question? Generic contract question. If it's in the state section, it is a specific the contract question. The other thing you'll see will be language that will specifically refer to it. It'll say the standard offer to purchase and contract the North Carolina Association of Realtors or the 2-T offer to purchase and contract. Look down in the bottom right. See where it says standard form 2-T? That's the Association of Realtors form number for this thing. They put a number for each form so that you don't have to rattle off the whole name. You can just say, oh, I need the 2T form. So on the test, they'll either say that the contract from the North Carolina Association of Realtors or the standard offer to purchase and contract from the North Carolina Association of Realtors or standard form 2-T. Those would all be indicators that you'd be talking about this particular contract. And that's why you've got to make sure you know I'm answering the question about this particular one, not about generic contract law. Is everybody good on that? Like last night, we talked about the idea of contingencies. What did we say a contingency was? Oh, not everybody at once, please. It's a stipulation, it's a condition. If you do this, then this doesn't happen. So. Put it in terms of a sales contract. What's the this doesn't happen? What wouldn't happen? This, this Sale, the closing, right? It's a way to get out of the contract. 
most commonly for who? What party normally wants to build in these kind of safeguards into a contract? Uh, buyers. buyers do. Buyers do. Purchasers, buyers want to build in these safeguards because the buyer has a lot of things to get accomplished in order to make that purchase happen, particularly if they're financing the deal. Because if they're financing the deal, we've got to worry about, does it appraise? Do I get the loan? Does the loan paperwork get done? Does it get funded? All those things come into play. So the buyer won't, might want to build a contingency in there. What we would call that a finance contingency. Does that make sense? What would an appraisal contingency be? If the property doesn't appraise for a certain amount, then the buyer can do what? Can back out and keep going. More importantly, that they can back out. They can back out and what? Get their earnest money back. Get their money back. Does that make sense? That's all generic contract. That's got nothing to do with this contract. Because the first thing I'm going to tell you about this contract is that there are no contingencies. Not a single one. There's not one contingency in this contract. In fact, it was specifically designed to eliminate contingencies. The whole point of the way this contract was laid out, we've been doing this thing since 2010, so this contract's now eight years old. When they designed this contract, the entire point was to eliminate contingencies. Because think about a contingency. If I don't lose 50 pounds by Christmas, then I can't go on vacation. That's a contingency, right? Well, talk to me about how you enforce that. Do you have to know? I mean, it's not enough just to say it. How am I going to enforce it? How, uh, what do I have to know, first of all? I got to know how much I weigh right now, right? So now we got to go weigh me. What else do I have to know? I got to know the date. I said by Christmas. What else? I got to know what I weigh at Christmas, don't I? So what we got to do? Weigh me again. And somebody's got to remember that that whole process is going on. Somebody's got to remember that the deadline is when? Christmas. Does that take a lot of babysitting? Yes. Contingencies are very labor-intensive. They're, they're a pain in the rear end is what they are. Yeah, they provide protection for the buyer, but at a cost of everybody else feels like they're constantly jumping through hoops. So think about a finance contingency. Okay, the buyer has to be able to get a loan or they don't have to go through with the purchase. That's a finance contingency, right? Are you just going to take their word for it? You're just going to let the buyer show up and say, oh, by the way, I can't get a loan. Give me all my money back. Is that going to work? No. Well, then what, talk to me about what kinds of things you have to verify. Who they're, who they're who's the, so now, up front, if you're going to do a finance contingency, i got to know who the lender is, right? And we got to talk to the lender and say, what kind of loan are they getting, right? And then we got to go back and talk to the lender later on and say what? Do they qualify? Can they get the loan? And if the lender says no, then we got to ask the lender, well, you, can you give me verification that they can't get the loan? Because the whole thing is, you've got to now release them from this contract, which you don't want to do. Does that make sense? So every contingency creates a royal pain in the rear end. They just are. Contingencies are pains in the butt to deal with. How about, a, how about a property condition contingency or a repair contingency? What would that say? They can back out if whatever repairs are not done. We specify a list of repairs and if these repairs aren't completed, how about if we just said a blanket statement? We're going to have an inspection and whatever the inspector finds you have to fix. And if you don't fix it, we can do what? Back out. Believe it or not, the contract prior to this one, that's exactly what it said. Can you imagine that? The contract literally said, you get, you get to have an inspection, and whatever you find on the inspection, the seller has to do what? Fix it, or the buyer can what? Can walk away. Now you think about how much of a pain in the rear end that is to enforce. 
So do you have to put a date on there by which they have to have the inspection? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And do you have to put a date on there by which they have to notify you of what needs to be fixed? Yes. Yeah. And then do you have to put a date on there which, uh, by which date the seller has to make the repairs? Yes. Because you've got to be able to verify them, right? And now, to make sure you've met the contingency, do you have to go out there and verify one by one that these repairs have been performed correctly? <coughs> do you see what I'm talking about with how much of a pain in the rear end that would be? These contingencies are nightmares when it comes to actually getting to closing. This contract, this standard offer to purchase and contract from the Association of Realtors was designed to eliminate all of that because what, it re what we had previously was a mess. We had a mess where nobody really knew when we had a contract because the buyer had so many contingencies going on at one time, it was nothing to see one contract which had an appraisal contingency, a finance contingency, an inspection contingency, all three built into the same contract. Is that really a contract at all? If that buyer wants out, are they not going to be able to find some reason among those three things to get the heck out? And when they did that, what was the seller going to get to keep? Nothing. Because the contingency says if I get out, I get what? My money back. All my money back. So that was what gave birth to this contract. This contract was created to avoid all of that confusion, to provide some certainty to the process. Does that make sense for everybody? So when we go through this thing, I want you to keep that in mind, that whole idea of avoiding contingencies. Now, when we talk about the sales contract, it is the document that outlines the agreement between the buyer and the seller. That's the whole purpose of the sales contract. Does it have to be in writing? Yes, a sales contract. I cannot repeat that enough. Do all real estate contracts have to be in writing? No. No. All real estate contracts do not have to be in writing because they're not all covered by the statute of frauds. Give me a perfect example of a real estate contract which is not covered by the statute of frauds. Leases. Buyer agency agreements would not be covered by the statute of frauds. They can be in what? They can be oral. But sales contracts are covered by the statute of frauds. They don't have to be in writing unless you want them to be what? Enforceable. There's that word. If you want them to be enforceable, you better have this thing in writing. Now, just because we say put it in writing doesn't mean we want you to write it. What are you allowed to do? Fill in the blanks. Fill in the blanks. Don't draft language. Don't add language. Don't subtract language. Don't even think about changing the pre... Here's the way I teach this to people. When you look at this form, the only place you can write here is where there's a blank. You can't write anywhere else. If there's not a blank, you're not allowed to write. Is that easy enough? And if there is a blank and you're allowed to write, you're only allowed to write what the blank was meant for. If it says date, what do you put in the blank? A date. 30 days from effective date is not a date. That is language. If you write that down, you're drafting contract language, you're practicing law without a license. Does that make sense? And I have real estate brokers all the time, they're like, well, we want to have a 30-day due diligence period. How do we do that? Hey, genius, take out a calendar and go one, two, three, four, five, and you count 30, and whatever day your little finger's on, that's the date you write on the line. Don't write 30 days from contract acceptance. Actually find it on the calendar and write the date on there. <laughs> Blows my mind sometimes what they do. Okay? So, we are going to talk about a lot about this standard offer to purchase and contract. But remember, it comes from the North Carolina Association of Realtors, not from who? Not from the Real Estate Commission. You, all of you will gloss that over in your brain and you'll miss a question because of it. Because I guarantee you, 100% guarantee you, that there will be at least one test question 
where they'll slide this in there and they'll say, the standard form approved by the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. No. There is no standard form approved by the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. What form does the Real Estate Commission say use? It just has stipulations that they use. Any form you want, right? What, any form that meets their basic rules. The Real Estate Commission doesn't say use this form. The Real Estate Commission says use a form that meets our rules. Do you think this form meets their rules? Yes. So be very careful of that kind of language on a test. They like to do that to throw you off. And I'll tell you why they do it. Because maybe if I give you their motivation, you might not miss it so much on a test. They don't like you. <laughs> they don't want to talk to you on the telephone. They especially don't want to talk to you on the telephone for you to gripe about a contract that they did not write. Do you think that happens all the time? They get a hundred phone calls a day, and so I understand their frustration. They get a hundred phone calls a day over there with somebody going, I'm using your stupid form, and I don't understand what I'm doing here. And they have to sit there for 15 minutes and explain, that's not our stupid form. Call who? The North Carolina Association of Realtors, because it's their stupid form, if you want to call it a stupid form. It's not the Real Estate Commission's form. Yes, they're very aware of this form. Yes, they can answer your questions about it, but they're not going to because it's not what? It's not their form. It's not their form. What they say is, use a form that's been generated by an attorney for use in North Carolina, which of course this form is. All right? So, when we talk about this form and any contract, here's another thing that the Real Estate Commission wants to make sure you understand. There are certain things that must be on there, and we're going to go through those. Don't worry about listing those out. You're not going to get tested on what must be on there because there's too many of them. There's 19 things that must be on there. But there's only two that absolutely cannot be on a sales contract. You see that last bullet point down there? What does it say? It says contract cannot include what? Any statements about what? Two things. Commissions or broker liabilities. Commissions or broker liabilities. True or false? Real estate brokers in North Carolina have to disclose all commissions and bonuses being, they're being paid in the transaction on the sales contract. False. False. That was a true statement until I said what? Sales. On the sales contract. Do brokers, ha and that's the kind of tricky mess they're going to do to you. Do brokers have to disclose their compensation? Yes. yes, and we have to do it in writing. But we do it anywhere but the sales contract because we're not allowed to mention it at all on the sales contract. The idea behind that is we're not a party to the contract. The contract's between what two parties? The buyer and the seller. And the buyer and the seller shouldn't be having a conversation about commission because it's not negotiated between the buyer and the seller. Does that make sense for everybody? We're never supposed to interject commission into the conversation between the buyer and the seller. Commission is something that we discuss between our firm and our client. So who would the seller discuss commission with? What firm? The listing firm. Who would the buyer discuss commission with? The selling firm. And the buyer and the seller would never discuss commission with, with, with each other because they could never put it where? On the contract. Does that make sense to everybody? Same thing is true for liability statements. It would be wonderful if we could put a statement on the contract that said the real estate brokers are held harmless and indemnified. I love that word, indemnified, from all claims. That means you can't do what? You can't sue me. I would love if we could put that on a contract. Guess what? We can't. We can't put anything about our commissions. They made us leave out all the good stuff. Man, two things I want to write on there. I want to get, I want to get paid and I don't want you to sue me. And I can't write either of those things in the contract. Everybody good with that? Okay. So no matter what contract you choose to use, make sure it follows that rule. We talked about it had to be in writing according to the statute of frauds.
Now, last night we started this discussion about offering acceptance, and we, I want to have it again because this is going to be one of the major, major test topics on the exam. This idea is probably five questions on the exam, no kidding. I mean, this is a huge deal. Think about the Real Estate Commission's perspective. What do you think one of the constant arguments they find themselves trying to figure out between brokers is? Are we what? Uh -huh. Under contract. That is one of the biggest sore spots that the Real Estate Commission has is brokers who don't recognize when a contract has actually been formed. So that's one of the big things they hit on the test is knowing the exact moment when that contract is formed. Oops, wrong button. So, when did we say that the contract is formed? When we communicate acceptance, right? And what is acceptance? Tell me what acceptance is. Email. That's not, that's communication. What is acceptance? Signing by who? The offer E. So acceptance is signature by the offeree. Does that put us under contract? No. No. Communication of that acceptance puts us under contract. Letting the other side know we're under contract puts us under contract. Does that make sense for everybody? All right. So when we talk about offers, remember that offers are take it or leave it. There's no such thing as we accept everything about your offer, nah, except we don't like this. You can't do that. What is that? That's a rejection first and foremost, and then it's a counter offer. Does that make sense? Because you can't have counter offer without having rejection. A counter offer is a rejection. And that's an important thing to remember because a lot of times when people counter offer and then the other party tries to walk away, they want to scramble and go back and accept the original offer. You can't do that because what did you do to the original offer? You rejected it. You killed it. There is no offer to accept at that point. When you make a counter offer, you've killed that process. Remember when we were drawing the arrows last night? What did I say the counter offer was going to do? What did you do with the counter offer? Start over. Wipe all the arrows off and start over. Okay? So when we talk about communication of acceptance, it's going to be really, really important to put everybody on the correct team to make sure that you've got a buyer's side of the transaction and a seller's side of the transaction. Now, I had this conversation with the day class the other day. Don't assume anything about these questions. Do not assume you know how that transaction's working and then try to make the question fit the image that's in your mind. If, there's a, if there are two brokers involved, what do you know? So you just did what I told you not to do. If there are two brokers involved, what do you know? That there's two brokers involved. That's all you know. That's all you know. But see, the natural tendency is that if you see two different names, they must be what? They must be on different sides. Folks, it don't work that way in these test questions. You have to read very carefully and see who it says they are representing. Tacy is a provisional broker with HPW Real Estate. And she is working with buyer JJ, who's been touring property with her. HPW Real Estate, with the permission of Keller Williams and listing agent Alice, are operating as sub-agents of the seller in the transaction. Tacy helps JJ prepare an offer. Submits to Dallas. Do I need to draw it out for you? Want me to start over? No, no, no. I'm trying to follow without it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Buyer, seller, right? Every transaction's got two sides. So here's what we said. Tacy is a provisional broker with HPW Real Estate. She is working with buyer JJ. So what do we know so far? JJ, buyer. Not a damn thing. Nothing. We know absolutely nothing. Because working with does not mean what? Representing. We know absolutely nothing yet. And if you, if you make that assumption, you have missed the question before you even read it. Are you following me on that? Working with does not mean working for. It does not mean representing. What kind of keywords would you have to look for to know she was actually representing that buyer? That she's a buyer's agent? That she's a buyer's representative? That she is she has executed a buyer agency agreement? Does that make sense? Those would be things that would indicate she is on JJ's side. The only thing we really know now is that the buyer's name is what? JJ. JJ. That's the only real piece of information we've gotten so far. You see how tricky it can be? And so, Tacy, with the permission of Keller Williams, the listing firm, and listing broker Alice, is, so can I stop right there? Listing firm Keller Williams, listing broker Alice, what team are they on? They are on the seller side. So we got Keller Williams. We got Alice. Tacy, with the permission of the listing firm Keller Williams and listing broker Alice, is functioning as a subagent of the seller in the transaction. Boom. Right there. What side is Tacy on? She is on the seller's side of the transaction. Can you say the um, statement, the, the question again? I'll start from the beginning. Okay. Tacy is a provisional broker with HPW Real Estate. She is working with buyer JJ who's looking at property in Raleigh. All we know at that point is that buyer's name is what? JJ. JJ. With the permission of listing firm Keller Williams and listing broker Alice. Listing firm means you represent who? Seller. Listing broker means you represent who? Seller. seller. So we can put Keller Williams and Alice on the seller side, correct? Yes. That's clear. With the permission of the listing firm and the listing broker, Tacy is functioning as a subagent of the seller in the transaction. So who does Tacy go with? Seller. She goes with the seller. Is everybody with me so far? So, so she's a sub agent of the seller. So she's working for the seller. Correct. She actually works for another firm too. Correct. You mentioned another firm. That's right. Yeah. And so could we also put so they HPW. <laughs> yes, they're cooperating, but they're all on what side? The seller the side. They're all on the seller's team. And don't sit there and go, this is not how this really happened. Yeah, I know it's not how it really happened, but it's what they said in the damn questions. That's what you have to do. And that's what I'm telling you. You have to, because what happens is what you try to do is picture the way it would be in the real world, and you try to make the question say that. That's not the way you can answer these. Does that make sense? So everybody good on where we are so far? Now, because let me map it out the way you assumed it was. You assumed it looked like this. Right? That was the assumption. That's the reality. Are you with me? So, Tacy assists JJ in preparing an offer to purchase the list, Alice's listing at 123 Main Street in Garner. 
use them in the standard offer to purchase and contract form from the North Carolina Association of Realtors. Tacy presents the offer to Alice, who immediately submits it to seller Ivy. Ivy reviews the offer. So should we start drawing some arrows? Should we start drawing some arrows? Yeah. So JJ gave the offer to who? Somebody over there. Tacy. Okay. Gave it to Tacy, right? Tacy helped him prepare the offer. And then what did she do with it? She gave it to Alice. And then what did Alice do with it? She gave it to the seller. And we know the seller's name is Ivy now, right? Ivy reviews the offer. She signs and accepts it with no changes and sends it back to Alice. Alice immediately scans and emails the signed document back to Tacy. <laughs> At what point in time did we have a valid binding contract? The answer is we don't. We don't because it never did what? It never crossed back. Tacy calls JJ to inform him his offer has been accepted. There you go. Now you do. Contract. Did the answer is the answer different if you had it mapped wrong? Yes. Absolutely. Because here's what it looks like if you had it mapped wrong. You got JJ the offer to Tacy. She sent it over to Alice, right? Is that right? Right. Now Alice sent it to the seller. Seller signs it without making any changes, sent it back to Alice, and then Alice sent it back to Tacy. Would it be a contract at that point? Yes. It would be, but because this is the wrong map, it wasn't a contract. You see where I'm going with that? You have to be ultra careful to make sure. It's not just about drawing the arrows. It's about making sure you get everybody on the correct team before you even start drawing the arrows. Okay, everybody okay with that? Okay, good. And we'll constantly kind of come back to that idea. But communication of acceptance is a huge deal. And there are going to be a bunch of those kind of questions on the test. Quite a few. You might get some experience with some of those kind of questions this week, maybe, in your free time. I'm not sure where you would, but you might. Oh, look. This last bullet point. Actually... Two bullet points. It says all offers have to be presented. What if we're already under contract? Do we still have to present the offers? Yes. Even if we're already under contract, folks, we still have to present the offers. And here's why. Could that change how the seller would approach things like negotiations for repairs as the contract moves forward? Like if you represent the seller and here's this buyer who's asked them to fix an HVAC system and you have another full price offer at the office and you didn't even present it to the seller because you figured, oh, we're already under contract, why, why waste my time? Because is the seller likely to have a different answer about fixing the HVAC if they know they got another buyer willing to pay full price for the property? If you know somebody else is willing to pay full price, what do you probably say to buyer number one about their HVAC? No as he is. Take it or leave it. Whereas if you don't know about that offer, you might be inclined to fix it or offer him a credit or something like that. You see where I'm going with that? So even when you're under contract, still present all offers. Here's another one. Multiple offers. It's a big deal now. This market. You get multiple offers on almost every transaction right now. Multiple offers are tough because you have to be very careful not to favor one offer over another in any way. In any way. You don't want to put any bias into the seller's decision making. Teresa, we got three offers on your house. It came in this morning. Here's the first one that came in about 8.15 this morning, and it's got an offer price of blah, 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 blah. 
This one came in about an hour later, and it's blah, 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 blah. And here's the last one that came in just before I left the office. Is that a way to present multiple offers? Why not? What did I do? I put them in order. Do people have a tendency sometimes to favor who got there first? First come, first serve, right? What's a better way to present the offers? Teresa, here are the three offers. Let's talk about all three of them. She doesn't even know which one came in first. It could bias her decision making. Does that make sense to everybody? So we have to work very hard not to favor one offer or another. I'll tell you another thing, and this kind of gets deep and it's not going to be a tested thing, but it might, make, it might help your brain about this idea of not favoring offers. One of the things the Real Estate Commission really discourages you do is offer a discount to your clients on the commission if it's a dual agency transaction. Now, a lot of brokers in the past have liked to do that because they feel like it makes them look better with their clients. Like, we're not trying to take advantage of you. It just so happens we also represent the buyer. And since we also represent the buyer, there's no need for us to get paid double. We're happy with taking less. You follow me so far? It's a wonderful sentiment. Here's the problem with it. If I'm presenting two offers, Trudy, here's the two offers that came in. Now, do I have to tell her that one's a dual agency offer? Yes. Yes, of course I do. So now, I can't give you any advice on this because this offer right here comes from a buyer that we also represent. All right? Now, you remember on this offer, you would only pay a 3% commission. Now, on this offer, <laughs> we don't represent the buyer, so you'd have to pay the full 6% commission. <laughs> is that favoring an offer right there? Absolutely it is. So the Real Estate Commission says, don't give a discount. Don't do that because you put yourself in a bad position. You start favoring one offer over another. So question. Yes. When you gave her all three options, I mean, uh, offers, what if the client asks which one came in first? If the client specifically wants to know which one came in first, then you're free to tell them. There's no rule that says you can't tell them that. Now, what I would say to them is, there's a reason I didn't tell you that in the first place. The reason I didn't tell you that in the first place is I did not want to interject that kind of favoritism in the thing. If you're telling me that's important to you and you'd like to favor the one that came in first, then I'll be glad to tell you which one came in first. Because there's no law that says I can't disclose to my client which offer came in first. Does that make sense? So if they specifically ask for it, absolutely. I saw some that, yes. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is don't offer a discount for certain buyers versus others. You can negotiate a commission, but make sure that commission is set and it's the same no matter what buyer comes along. If it's 6% for this buyer, then it's 6% for that buyer and 6% for that buyer. Don't have this system set up where, well, if these buyers make an offer, it's 6%, but if this group of buyers makes an offer, it's 3% because that inherently favors this group of buyers. Yes, ma'am, Marla. No, maybe I, I'm sorry, I'm a bit, I guess I missed it because um, we're not supposed to give any opinion whatsoever on the offer. Is that what you're saying? We are absolutely supposed to give them opinions <laughs> and advice about the offers as long as we're not in what? Dual agency. dual agency. Now, if we're in dual agency, we can't give opinions or advice okay. about the offer. So when you discuss about the three offers, so you said don't favor them, okay? But then you said let's talk about it. Yes. That doesn't mean I'm not going to advise to accept one or say, advise that I think one is stronger than the other. There's a difference between favoring one and the way it's presented, though. You know, okay. uh, don't inject favoritism into the thing any more than you can have to. Offering advice is absolutely what you should do. Okay. You know, I think this is the strongest offer because it has the strongest group of numbers. Okay. You know? So you want to just go with the strongest? Yes. Just... Absolutely. Yes, Michelle. Um, it, it doesn't have to do with numbers, but I've seen it done before and I won't say where. Um, but if someone wants to write a letter 
A personal letter. Yes. Uh huh. To the um, to the seller. Uh huh. What do we do in that situation? What side am I on? I can't answer that kind of a question without you telling me what side I'm on. Am I on the buyer side or am I on the seller side? Buyer side. If I'm on the buyer side. The buyer wants to write a personal letter because they think it gives them what? A leverage. A leverage, an advantage, right? Sob story. What, who, who, what, what's my job to, rep, to do? Give them every advantage I legally can, right? So am I going to help them do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, am I going to make sure that we don't include anything in the letter which would violate the law, like fair housing violations and all those kinds of things, right? I should do that. But if I'm on the buyer side, from on the seller side, why does the buyer want to submit the letter? They, they want the, the sob stuff. They want the they want the home team discount, right? They want the and so what do you think my advice is to sellers about those personalized letters? You don't need to see this mess. Oh God, is it a thing? Oh, they send you the investment. My I got four kids and they've all got leukemia and they all have treatments at the building right across the street from your house and we don't have a car, so it would be really wonderful if you'd sell us your house. I mean, I mean, they they Facebook stalk the sellers. I've seen them. I've seen them. You know, you have a seller that because a lot of times your sellers will have like these you know keys. Like they say they're an NC State fan. God help them. But say so they are. And say the key to the house is an NC State key. Have you seen people that have their keys like that, right? Well, do you think that buyers gonna notice that when they go tour the property? Are they gonna notice when their agent puts the key in the door that, or that there's NC State stuff in the house? So then, when they send that personalized letter, magically they're all wearing NC State gear and they go pack at the bottom of it. Wow. People are desperate in this market. They will do anything to try to manipulate that seller into accepting their offer. So I have a very real conversation with the seller before we even start taking offers. And I say, listen, these, are, these letters are coming. They're probably going to be part of the process. My advice to you would be not even to read them. My advice to you would be just to let's throw them to the side because if you think about what they're designed to do, what they're designed to do is to incentivize you or sway you to accept an offer on something other than the financial criteria. And if you want to accept it just based on the financial criteria, the best thing, because you can't unread them once you've read them. It does. And they, and they do have a very big impact sometimes. Yes, ma'am. I would know if it was Okay. They can come in at any time. We don't know. Yep. That's unpredictable. Yep. Now, you just said, don't this offer, this offer, this offer, came in the morning and the afternoon and the evening. Right. Like, you don't hold them all day. If the offer comes in, you have to present it at that time. No, you can present it at the first available opportunity. Some sellers want to see them as soon as they come in. They want you to forward them to them right then. But some sell that's a discussion between them, between you and the seller. Exactly. Some sellers would say, all right, let's just 5 o'clock Sunday afternoon, we'll sit down and we'll go over all of them. So what you would do is you would collect all of them, and at 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, you would lay them all out and go over them at one time. We will be reviewing these offers at 5 p.m. on Sunday. But does yep. that have to be in the MLS then? No, it doesn't have to be. Okay. Remember, the seller has no, no timeline to respond unless the buyer puts a, a stipulated timeline as the offer expires at a certain time. So, question, when you were talking about um, they're still accepting offers once they're under contract, mm -hmm. how does that work if they get another offer and it's better than it doesn't. You just said to think they're under what? Contract. But remember, these contracts rarely remain exactly the same from the time we start to the time they finish. The buyer often makes requests along the way. The, the deal here is, could the seller's response to those requests be changed based on the knowledge that they have another offer that because if you get an offer in the day after you go under contract you get an offer in it's twenty five thousand dollars more than the one you just accepted i mean the buyer comes and says listen you know we don't want to be too picky but you know the grass really needs to be cut could you cut the grass i'm gonna be like no uh-uh Mm -mm. I'm going to let it grow up over the top of the house. I'm going to plant weeds. I'm going to let it get just as ratty as it possibly can. If you're the seller, because what do you want that buyer to do? 
You want them to walk away. You can't just take another offer, but you can sure all of a sudden be real hard to get along with and I hope they walk away. Does that make sense? And that's why as a broker, you have a responsibility to let the seller know that that other offers come in because it might dictate how they proceed. Right. They're not breaching the contract. They're just simply playing tough, right? And hoping that they'll, I mean, I actually I had somebody call me last week. Uh, uh, she was a buyer's agent. She said, I just had a conversation you would not believe. And I said, well, what happened? She said, well, I was told something by a listening agent I've never been told in my whole career, and I wanted to call you because I think I need to file a complaint with the real estate commission. I said, well, what did she say? She said, we hope you do terminate. I said, and what else did she say? She said, that was it. I said, and what about that was so egregious that you think you need to report her to the real estate commission? She said, she told me she hoped we terminated. I said, well, then I would take her at her word. She probably does hope you terminate. What you need to do is get your rear end off your shoulders and stop being all hurt feelings and read between the lines of what she's telling you. What is she telling you? They have a better what? Offer. She's telling you the truth. Please do. Bye. We would love for you to terminate. And that's what I said to her. I said, she did you the best possible favor she could have. She gave you information that is very useful to you because now you can go back to your buyers and say, we need to stop pushing these people because they've got a better offer in hand most likely and we're not going to get anything out of them. So you need to make a decision right now. Do you want to take it as is and move on or do you want to terminate and let them, because they've clearly made it clear they would love for you to walk away. Do you get where I'm coming from with that? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, now, when we go back to this thing where we talk about um, the seller being able to walk away, and then when you have the other side of the coin, you know, the seller is going to walk away. Right. 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 That's a lawsuit for specific performance. We're not talking about a seller that's refusing to sell the house. We're just uh, well, we're not even talking about a seller who wants to sell somebody else. We're just talking about a seller that's not going to go out of their way to help you because they would prefer you do what? You back out and walk away. You're doing them a favor by walking away, so they're just going to be a jerk the rest of the way. There's no law that says they can't be a jerk the rest of the way. See, normally we like to think of this as all nice, nice, and it's wonderful when it is, and it most of the time is. But if you've got a seller that the day after they go under contract gets an offer for twenty or thirty thousand dollars more, they are praying every night when they go to bed to get a termination from that buyer because they want to do what? They want to accept offer number two. Hopefully, offer number two is still there. Well, and maybe they got it as a backup offer. If they got it as a backup, maybe they accepted it as a backup offer. You can accept a backup offer. Accepting a backup offer says if something happens to contract number one, this contract immediately becomes the primary contract. So they could accept it as a backup contract. Wow. So just going on the contract don't mean it's a done deal. It does. You're missing the point here. You want them to be nice in the process. That ain't part of the deal. They didn't promise to be nice. What did they promise to do? Sell the house. What I'm telling you is when the seller's in that position, that's all they're going to do is sell the house. They're not going to clean. They're not going to cut the grass. They're not going to fix anything because they are literally hoping they can make the buyer mad enough that the buyer will do what? Walk away. See, they can't walk away because they'll get sued, but they can make the buyer mad enough that the buyer does what? Walks away, which is what they want anyway. In that kind of a situation, does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Contracts are war. They're not nice. It's a fight, especially in this market. I've, now, there have been times in my career when contracts were the most easy going, laid back. When you've got kind of a balanced market and the buyer has time. I remember days when you had time to do a second showing. I haven't seen a second showing in three years. Wow. You know why? It ain't there long enough. It used to be one of those things where you would go look and you would show them four or five houses and they would say, okay, well, we want to go back next weekend and look at this one. 
again. And guess what? You can go back next weekend and you show it to them again. You might even go back for a third show in the following weekend. You might look at this thing three times over three weeks. <laughs> now, in three hours, it's under contract. And the buyers are clawing each other's eyes out to get there. So it makes the, con it makes the whole transaction much more confrontational. And it makes the contracts much more confrontational. So it means you've got to understand the contract that much more. Everybody okay so far? Okay? So present all offers and don't favor anyone. Now, we say that offers can't be changed without them being rejected. If you make even the slightest change, you have not accepted the offer. What you've actually created is a what? Is a counter offer. That's exactly right. The other thing to remember is that an offer can always be pulled off the table. Now, a contract cannot be pulled off the table, but an offer can. So, the offer or can always take away their offer any time up to what point? When the acceptance is communicated. Because at that moment, it's no longer an offer. It is a what? Contract. So, let me give you an example of that. Let's say that Wendy is a buyer's agent who's executed an exclusive buyer agency agreement with her firm and buyer CAM. So who does Wendy represent? Wendy is a buyer's agent who's executed an exclusive buyer agency agreement with buyer CAM. Who does Wendy represent? CAM, the buyer, clearly, right? You got a buyer agent. Don't get gun shy because you screwed up one time. Just recognize that you screwed up because you were making assumptions. There's no assumption there. If they executed a buyer agency agreement, who does she represent? The buyer. the buyer. Okay? So Wendy and Cam are on the same team. Cam has completed an offer to purchase and contract on Brianna's listing at 123 Main Street in Clayton. Brianna presents the offer to the seller, Ashley. Ashley signs and accepts the offer with no changes being made and sends it back to Brianna. Brianna immediately calls, what did I say, the listening agent was? I mean, the buyer's agent was? Or was Wendy? Right. Couldn't remember which one of you was which. Brianna immediately calls buyer's agent Wendy to inform her of the seller's acceptance. As soon as Wendy answers the telephone, Wendy informs Brianna that the buyer has rescinded their offer before any further communication can happen. At what point in time do we have a binding contract? We don't. Because even though it was signed, and even though Brianna's calling to communicate acceptance, what happened first? The offer got rescinded first. So therefore, we do not have an agreement. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So offers can always be pulled off the table. Now, don't let them talk you out of that on a test. They're masters at talking you out of something on a test. Alice has made an offer, and she stipulated the offer will expire at 5 p.m. on Friday. She stipulated that the offer would expire at 5 p.m. on Friday. At 4 o'clock Thursday afternoon, she informs the seller that her offer has been terminated. Can she do this? Of course she can, because an offer can always be terminated prior to what? Ex communication of acceptance. See, they will try to talk you out of that because she said the offer was going to be good till Friday at 5. Well, guess what? She changed her mind. As long as it's not become a contract, she can certainly terminate the offer. Everybody okay with that? Okay. So be careful about that. And we talked about counteroffers. The big thing with a counteroffer is that it is a rejection. First and foremost, it is a rejection of the offer. Make sure you remember that. It kills the original offer. Now, as far as how communication can happen, how can communication happen? Well, any form of communication is okay. There's no requirement that it be in a certain way. Would telephone work? Yes. Fax, yes. email, yes. Yes. Yeah, whatever. 
Any. I'm not going for it two nights in a row. I'm not that brave. Any form of communication works. And it's not when the communication is received, it is when it is what? Sent. Sent. And the other thing to remember is, it doesn't have to go to a specific person. Communication simply has to cross from one what? One side to the other side. Anybody on this side to anybody on this side. It doesn't matter if the communication has been heard or read. It matters that it's been what? Sent. It matters that it's been sent. And that's where we come to the mailbox rule. People wrap themselves in knots with the mailbox rule. The mailbox rule is what I just explained. It's not when it's received, but when it is what? Sent. So if you were communicating acceptance with this wonderful gadget right here, first of all, can you communicate acceptance with that box? Yes. Sure you can. If you were, when would you be under contract? As soon as you put it in the box. The second you put it in the box. The second you put now. You all ask a different question. How can you verify that? That's not your job. Whose job is that? that? That's not even the post office's job. That is a court of law's job to decide when that happened. The law simply says it's a contract the moment it goes where? In the box. In the box. Because that's when it's sent to the other side. It, here's the thought process. It's a felony to reach in there and get the thing back out, right? So once you put it there, you can't do what with it? take it back. By the way, that law also applies to your mailbox at your house. When you put it in the box and you put the flag up, it's a felony to go in there and reach and take it back. I don't recommend, I don't think you'd actually be prosecuted for that, but technically speaking, it is. So you've got all this demand on the buyer's agents buying each other's eyes Yes. And Wendy is picking up the phone to say, um, I just changed my mind. Uh-huh. Or Rihanna can communicate. And Rihanna goes, oh, too bad. I just call and let you know. I dropped it in the mailbox two hours ago. That's and a cell phone. And she runs out and puts it in a box mm -hmm. where the mailbox is. That's, that's tough. You end up in court with an argument and the judge is going to have to decide who's telling the truth there. We need Judge Judy. Where's she at when you need her? You know? <laughs> that's a tough one. And, and, and ultimately, you would just have to let a court of law figure that out. Now, that's precisely the reason why I say just because this is a legal method of communication does not mean it's a good method of communication. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes, so, ma'am. Like email? Email, much better. Because the moment they click send on an email, is that a verifiable time? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Much better method of communication. This one still works, but it's not a good one. Well, it's better not to call them so you can't on the phone. Yeah, sending an email would be even better because on an email you can't they can't interrupt you and say, oh, I was calling you to take our offer back or, you know, I'm glad you called because we were pulling our offer off the table. Whereas if she had just, so what, if Brianna was super smart, here's what she would do because it's nice to make the phone call and say, well, congratulations, we've accepted your client's offer. But I and because when then here's when Wendy says, Oh, I was calling you to tell you my class you're sending my offer, and Rihanna's gonna go, Oh, I'm so sorry, I just sent you an email right before I called you, so we're under contract. Mm -hmm. Bye, because now she's got two timestamps she's got the one where she sent the email and the one where she did what made the, phone call. made the phone call, and clearly you can show which one happened first at that point. Does that make sense? You'd be under contract. Now, here's what you have to be careful of with the mailbox rule. And I'm going to warn you in advance, they're going to try to do it to you on the test. Remember, you're only communicating acceptance when the, when the communication is crossing the division between the two sides of the transaction, right? So, let's say that buyer's agent JJ has helped his client put together an offer to purchase. His client Marlo helped, helped her put together an offer to purchase and contract 
on a listing that's listed with Keller Williams and uh, provisional broker Ivy who has taken the listing for Keller Williams. So here's your buyer side, right? JJ and Marlo. And here is your listing side, Keller Williams and Ivy. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So JJ delivers by hand the offer to purchase to um, Ivy at Keller Williams. Ivy reviews the offer with the seller. The seller signs and accepts the offer, making no changes, and drops it in the mail back to Ivy. At what point in time do we have a valid binding contract? No. We don't. Who's she mailing it to? Herself. The seller's mailing it to themselves, right? The seller's mailing it to the listing broker. That is not communication of acceptance. Do not let them talk you into the fact that just because it went into a mailbox that it is the mailbox rule. The mailbox rule only applies if it was being mailed where? To the other side. So somebody over here. Does that make sense? You follow me on that? So be very careful of that. Yes, ma'am, Michelle. Um, how long has this rule been in existence? How long has this rule been in existence? Since the Pony Express? Okay. So <laughs> I'm not kidding. It has. I mean, this is one of the oldest pieces of contract law we have, actually. Has there been any talk about changing that so they can actually have something that's verified? Um. I'm not sure, you know, not, not everybody keeps up with new technology, but we do have this new thing called email, which can be verified. I get that, but okay. So if you want something that's going to be verified, don't send it like this. You can also send certified. You can also send certified mail. Here's the downside of certified mail. Slow. So here, now here would be the potential. Now this, I hope I never deal with in my career. Let me show you what could happen with something like a cert, like certified mail. So let's say that Patrice is selling her house. Okay, everybody, so so far so good. Wendy's her agent. We got listing broker Wendy and Patrice, and they're selling the house. They put the house on the market. They get ten offers. They're all above list price. Okay. Now one of the offers comes from Teresa who is an unrepresented buyer. And then there's several other offers. One comes from Alice, who represents a buyer. And one comes from Ivy with a different firm, who represents a different buyer. They're coming from all over the place. Everybody with me so far? So the offers come in, and Patrice emails out a counteroffer to each one of them, which, number one, is a bad idea. Don't counteroffer to more than one person, because what could happen? They could all what? Except they could all accept. So now, Patrice has emailed out this counter offer to all these three buyers. Ivy goes on the offer, the counter offer with her client, and her client says, "I need some time to think about this. This is way above its price." Teresa immediately signs the counter offer and drops it in the mail, certified mail, back to Patrice. So talk to me about that one. Is that a contract? Yes, that is a contract. Buyer side, communicating acceptance to what? Seller side, that's a contract. Is everybody with me on that? Here's the problem, does Patrice have any idea she's under contract? No. So later that afternoon, Ivy's buyer decides he will also accept signs it and Ivy sends an email copy back to Patrice and Wendy and Wendy says thank you and she marks the property as being under contract and two days later she gets the certified mail and sees that it was sent earlier by Teresa. That's a nightmare scenario right there. That's a nightmare scenario and what was it created by? multiple counter offers to multiple buyers all at the same time. So what does that tell you about, th about that? Don't do, Don't do it. it. 
A better way to respond would have been to say, we have multiple offers. If you want to change your offer, if you want to address it, if you want to do something different, send that to me and I'll look at it. Because that's not a counteroffer, is it? Right. Have, have you had people do that before? Yes. Well, a counteroffer to multiple people? So yes. I have heard of it. That's never happened in a transaction that I was involved in. But yes, I've heard of it happening. Yes. They got to go to court. They got to go to court to figure it out. And I can tell you, a court of law is probably going to honor Teresa's contract because of the mailbox rule. Because of the mailbox rule. But then that's going to create all kinds of frustration and angst for the other buyer. And yeah, it's not going to be pretty. I see a hand. Well, I was going to ask the same thing. I, okay. was, I was thinking Teresa would have the other hand. She would. She would, most likely. But it would be for a court to decide. Are we understanding this I this idea? Yes, ma'am. I understand that part, but in this environment we're in now, yep. probably most of it, I mean, we just sold our house and it was all text and email. Yep. And literally when we had multiple offers, he was yep. he's like, before we sign, let me pull my email. Hey, let's see. Like, you know. Mm -hmm. That's probably what they mostly do. Yeah, absolutely. In the, Instant communication. You know, like email that's why email is gonna always well, I won't say it'll always be the king, but for right now. Email is the king because it's instant, it's verifiable, it's time stamped. And with email, not only do you have the capacity to communicate, but can you attach the actual document to the email? You know, not only can we tell you we've accepted it, but here's a copy of the signed document. You know, so that's that's why email is a better option. Yes, ma'am, please. DocuSign technology with DocuSign. Mm-hmm. Where it's on documents down to the second. Yeah. Somebody Digital signed. signatures. Does it? Does it send it back to anybody or yes. take any steps in that part of the communication? It does. It does. So the question is, if you're using electronic signatures, digital signatures, which most of us in the business do use now, DocuSign is an example, um, Dot Loop is an example, Zip Forms is an example, um, where the clients or customers are signing these documents instantly and electronically by going on their computer and they essentially draw a signature and then they just click in a box and it applies their signature and it does, it marks it down to the second. She's saying, does it take on the communication role? And the beauty of it is, yes it does. Because when you go in and you set up, the, it's only if you know what you're doing with it though. You know, it's a, you got the user has to understand what they're doing. But when I go in and I set up a document for digital signatures, what I do is set it up so that instantly when all the parties have signed, it emails a copy back to everybody who signed it. So basically communication of acceptance becomes instant with acceptance because as soon as the signature gets clicked, it's emailed that document to everybody that was a party to that contract, which means we've communicated acceptance, which means we're under contract. Yes? Mm -hmm. Even if they're sitting in front of them, they'll, they'll do DocuSign with them sitting right in front of them because of that, because of the documentation features of it. I love digital signatures. It's a, oh, God, that's the best thing that ever happened in this business. Yes, digital signatures. At I mean, I had to drive to Chapel Hill today and pick up closing documents for a closing. You know, that's tomorrow afternoon in Roanoke Rapids. And so I got to drive them because they need wet signatures and notarized documents, and it would be lovely if digital signatures will work, but they don't, so. Still do it the old fashioned way for closings. At least right now. Okay? Everybody good on this idea? The mailbox rule and communication of acceptance. Okay? Now, why don't we do this? Let's go ahead and take our first break, okay? And when we come back, we are going to start going through the standard offer to purchase and contract. We're going to talk about the things that are specific to this particular contract. Alright? Um, I'm sorry, time. Uh, what is it, 722, 7.45? How about that? That work? It's like 17 minutes.